All right, well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I saw kind of there. I said, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today is a blessed day. It is the third of our appointed times, or in Hebrew, was known as the Moabadim. And it is Shavuot. Now, if you remember earlier, the year started with Passover. Yes, the year started with Passover, and then immediately at the Passover, we began the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which takes place for a duration of seven days. Now, Passover is not a Sabbath. Passover is a memorial. So work is still permitted um, on Passover. Mashiach says, uh, so often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So that remembrance is what gives us the memorialization of Pashak. We are to remind ourselves what he did on that day and what his sacrifice meant for us. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, as I've taught the year prior, um, speaks on the sin being in one's uh, heart and or spirit. You know, we used to go and look for leaven or yeast throughout the house and we would sweep it out. And this is what, you know, came, uh, became uh, what we know as spring cleaning because we would overturn couches and chairs and you know because yeast would get all over when you cook you making bread it flies and then it settles you know so because paul says a little least uh yeast a little leaven lump is the whole lump we would try to eradicate our whole house of yeast right now you know that you are the living temple of um elohim and the temple is a dwelling or a bait a house and that the yeast represents the sin so in the same vigor that we used to try to eradicate our physical homes with, uh, um, from the sin and the yeast, how much more be it the ones that we live in every day? You know, to make it a sin-free environment. Because it starts with self. No one can force you to sin. They can convince you, but ultimately you have to give yourself over to it. Like when Eve had the, the dialogue with the serpent, she should have said to herself, once he told her something that was adverse from what her husband had told her, she should have rejected the whole message, but she started to eat from that. And she started wondering, like, hmm, so tell me more. And that's what led her down the path. She didn't eradicate. That little bit of hmm led to what we know today in the world. The murdering, the killing, and that, the whole night. Now that's how important the Feast of Eleven Bread is. The Feast of Eleven Bread has two Sabbaths. The first day is a Sabbath, and then the seventh day is a Sabbath. So we have two Sabbaths. All the high holy days are not Sabbaths. Shavuot is a Sabbath. It's the third Sabbath, and it happens to be the third of the Moedim. Now, Shavuot is called many things. It's called Shavuot. It's called the Feast of, uh, I'm sorry, the Feast of Weeks. And it's also known um, by the Christian counterparts as Pentecost. The reason why in Hebrew we call it Shavuot is because we are to count seven weeks from Passover to get to Shavuot. And I'm going to tell you why I believe the, the Most High wanted us to count seven weeks. And you know, in Hebrew, the, the, the Shavuot or the Shabbat is, is the uh, root word, like in Shabbat, the Sabbath, the end of the week. So we get the, the uh, Feast of Weeks from Shavuot. That's why we call it the Shavuot. It's also called, called the Feast of First Fruits because on this day, as, you, as we start to read, you'll see, the um, high priest would take their first grain fruit offerings, okay? Remember in Passover is when it buds. The ears are green, but they're not ready to be harvested yet. Seven weeks later, they're good. You can harvest that and then you present it. You take the first fruits. And one thing about the first fruits, like I've said before, if you know anything about planting, they are always the best. They get the best um, nutrients from the soil. They soak up the most rainwater, so that they're, they're typically the fattest, you know, and the most ripe. And then, of course, they get the best sunlight because there's no other trees or anything blocking them because they're the first to sprout up. Now, later on, that tree may become bigger and have other branches. Watch your feet. Have other branches. And, you know, that tree may not get as much sunlight. But the first fruits always get the best everything. Sunlight, rain, um, the, the soil. So it's an honor to have your first fruits. And we would take those and present them to the Most High. Now, in preparing um, in preparing the first fruits, not anyone could just touch them. Only a kosher rabbi 
could touch them. You could not handle them. They could not have fallen to the ground and been picked up. They had to have been pruned, meaning you need shearers. They never really touched them. You shear them and then bowed and fall into the basket. Could not be touched. I'm stressing that point because as we read, you'll realize the importance of what this means prophetically. We never understood why we had to do these things. You know, uh, what, the, the first fruit grains, what, what did it mean? Why was it so important? But it was a big thing in Israel back then. We'd all dress up in white. We'd get sheaves and wave them in unison, the whole entire nation. And you'd see the, the high priest marching down the colonnade on their way to the temple with the first fruit grain offerings. And it was a sight to see. Israel would, would, would become overly jubilant with a caucus noise that would rise up to the heavens. The ground would tremble because the whole nation, native and foreigner, would be taking the part in this festival. And honoring almost high. And the fact that he just given us this new plentiful bounty. And we didn't have to sacrifice any humans for. We didn't have to debase ourselves for it. We had the only thing that the, the pagans and the Gentiles do. We didn't do any of those things. We simply just kept his commandments. Each year we got a new abundant of fruit. And the first fruits we just preserved to him. Because he was worthy of so. So that's what happened on Shavuot. And I want to read you real quick in Leviticus. We're going to Leviticus chapter 23. And I'm going to start at, I'm going to start in verse 9 in chapter 23. <clears throat> right, you guys, let me know when you get there. It says, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and you shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Remember, you got to bring it to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waved the sheaf. That's how we got 50 days. All right? Because we had to count seven weeks from Passover. Then you add one more day after the last Shabbat, which means it would be Sunday. That gave us 50 days. That's why the Christians call it Pentecost. Because it's five or the 50. The penta means five. So the Christians call it Pentecost for this very reason. Um, and it says... And on that day when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, as a burnt offering to Yahweh, and its grain offerings two tenths of an offer of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, as a sweet fragrance, and, and, and its drink offering, which has one fourth of a hen of wine, and you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim. A law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Right? So you were not even to eat of that first harvest until it had been prepared first. You could not touch it. You could not consume it. It had to have been waved and presented before the Father first. It says, And, the morrow, and from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep or the wave offering, you should count for yourself seven complete Sabbaths. And until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days, then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahweh. Now, this is all that we're really told about Shavuot. And it doesn't really give us much. If we go in the same chapter to verse 20 to verse 22, it says, And the priest shall wave them besides the, besides the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yahweh. Besides the two lambs, they are set apart to Yahweh for the priest. And on this same day, you shall proclaim a Kodesh Mikra, or a holy convocation, meaning a gathering, the holy gathering. We are to gather, right? Um, for you, do not do any servile work on it. This is how we know it's a Sabbath. A law forever in your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field when you reap. And do not gather any gleaning from your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the stranger. Now you understand how Ruth was able to go and do what she did on Boaz's field. We really did this throughout the days, not just on Shavuot. You left some there 
Ruth was poor. We had already been given the commandment, don't pick up everything from corner to corner of your field. The fields were, they were in acres. Start so would do today, they were like gridded out. So you had a, a, a certain plot and it was, always, it was never circular, it was always square because those are easier to maintenance. And you were not to pick it clean from corner to corner. Same thing, you leave that for the poor. But again though, outside of us knowing this is the Sabbath, that, that uh, we are to present the first fruits, we don't have any other thing to go off on to explain what, what is Shavuot though. The Bible doesn't tell us, I guess in plain language, so to speak. But like I said before, this book is a book that you'll need the spirit of discernment and just the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit in and of itself to truly unlock it. Because anyone can pick this book up and read it. A Gentile can pick the book up and read it. A scholar, a Luciferian, a Satanist, uh, a Mormon, a Mason. Anyone can pick it up and read from it. It's not locked in that regard. But to truly, truly unhinge the meat, pull back the pillin, you're going to need that spirit. And the fear of y'all is the beginning of wisdom and those that keep his commandments have a good understanding. You're going to need that to understand this book. Right? So from here, I want us to go into Exodus chapter 19. And from 19, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 30. And we're going to have some fun when we do this too because I'm going to uh, bring some more edification and education in, in this passage here. Now, we left Egypt, crossed over the Yom Suf, which I spoke of in the Passover lesson. And then we ended up in the Sinai wilderness. Finally, we made it to Mount Sinai, which is in modern day Saudi Arabia. A lot of us, when I say us, I mean believers, and even scholars alike, theorize that it took us seven weeks from the time we left Egypt to the time we got to Mount Sinai to get the commandments. We left Egypt when? On Passover. Seven weeks it took us to get to Mount Sinai. And we're also told seven weeks on Passover to commemorate this. So in the Hebrew community, even in the Ashkenazi Jewish community, the thinking is, this is the day, on this day, that we received the Ten Commandments. It's a commemoration of that. When we were either married to the Most High or betrothed to the Most High. And like I said, betrothal or betrothal is not the same as engagement being, you know, here in the West. When you're engaged, it's like you're not really married. When you're betrothed in the Bible, though, it's not the same as engagement. You are practically married. Only difference is you have not um, consummated the marriage. Your wife may not have joined your household just yet. And she may not have access to the inheritance. But all around town, she's known as Mrs. Such and Such. She's his wife, not wife to be, that's his wife. Because you know people here get engaged and they'll be engaged for like eight years. So you can kind of half in, half out. When you be drove somebody, you're saying, hey, listen, it's like, I don't know, maybe like Larry, when you put it down and you can come pick it up. They're going to take it off the shelves. No one else can go buy it. They can look, but they can't touch it. It's yours. That's what that meant. And it's saying that I'm going to commit. I just have something right now that I'm not able to come and finalize the rest of the deal. Again, speaking to the father, like in the case of Isaac. Isaac sent, I believe, Eliezer, who worked for Abraham, by the way. And they went to go and they met Rebecca. Isaac was never there. Eliezer pushed the gold bracelet on her wrist. That symbolized, hey, you're going to be married to my, my Lord. His name is Isaac. Get chalk. She had never met him. Isaac never met her yet. So while they're doing this, and they stayed out there for a couple of days, if not a couple of weeks, I'm not, you know, I don't really remember, but she was betrothed. At that point in time, she could no longer be married all to any other person. It wouldn't have been kosher. Anyway, a lot of us speculate that on Shavuot, this is the day that we received the Ten Commandments. This is the day that Israel said, I do. Rebecca said, I do, I'll go. They asked her. Her brother, leaving, and her father said, will you go? And she said, I do. I will. Like you see when you're getting married, I do. So let me read to you really quickly in chapter 19, verses 1 through 20. It says, In the third month after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, on this day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they set out from Riphadim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai. Now this place, uh, Rifadim, what is that? It's a place in the Bible 
And I want to I want to talk about this real quickly. That's the place where we were thirsty. We commanded Moses, we commanded him to give us some water. Moses was so afraid that we would stone him that he cried out to Yah. Man, save me. This is this is like the second or third time that we we talking about killing this guy. The first time was at uh the Yom Suf when he brought us to Nueva Beach. And we seen that we had a wadi, water to our backs, and to our fronts was this massive uh, amount of water. And you had the Egyptians closing in on us. We figured he was a double legend. We was about to kill him then. About to kill him then. The Lord's money that we are to touch not. It shows how much Israel had true regard for the world. Look at the, look, look at the spirit. So we get to, now mind you too, while we're in the desert, there is a large cloud during the day. That hovers over us. So when though we're in the blazing heat, we don't feel it. Like Daniel's friends were in the furnace, they didn't feel it. It's all around them. They're in the environment. They're just covered. In the desert, we were legitly, literally covered. And because we were up in the millions, this was a large cloud that blotted out the harsh rays of the sun where there is no shrub at all. And he covered us. And we still complained. During the nighttime, you know it gets cold in any desert, whether it be the Mojave, whether it be the uh, um, um, the Gobi Desert, or the way in Asia. It gets cold in any desert at nighttime. It's, a, it's an environment of extremes. Well, during the nighttime, there was a big pillar of fire that was above us. I'm sure it gave us not just light, but also heat, and much needed heat. Also would have kept off scorpions, would have kept off a lot of these things that you don't really want to deal with in the wilderness. Camel spiders. Ever heard of a camel spider? Yeah. Go Google it. You wake up with camel spiders in your bed. Go Google camel spiders. Um, what you never want to deal with those. Okay, but they don't, they, this, this, whew, this fire billowing. They're not going to be around that. So he protected us, yet we still found ways to complain. We get to Rephidim. And we command, demand Moses to give us some water. How he's going to make it happen, we don't even care. Just do it. Because we are thirsty. And that's all that matters. And so, you know, it starts to become so, it's so loud that it engulfs the people in his fervor. And he cries out. And of course, Moses is told to strike the rock. Which I have a picture of, and if you're watching this production, you should see it on your screen right about now. That's the rock that's found northwest of Mount Sinai, I believe, in a different area. Uh, the, the Wadi, it's called the Wadi Ferry. Split rock, and it's huge. And I think I talked about this in Passover as well. That's the rock that they split for the water to come out. But more happened there too. Apparently, there were other people who lived over there, the Amalekites, and they attacked Israel. They did. And Moses, Joshua, and a man, a man named Hur watched from the hills. This is all in the Bible. And Moses seen that when he lifted up his hands, Israel was prevailing. But when he got tired and dropped them, we started losing. So, you know, Moses was like, oh, shit. So Aaron, I'm sorry, Joshua and her, they say, nah, nah, we're going to get you a chair. They get him a chair. And they was like, don't even worry about it. We're going to hold you up. So they held his arms up. Because imagine you trying to hold your arms up for 30 minutes this street. What about a couple hours? You're like, man, can you hurry up and kill him, please? You're shaking like a stripper, you know? But you don't want to lose. It could be that one time you drop your arms and then they, they make a, a, a coup, they go out, a fatal blow, and now you lose the war. So... Joshua and her held up his hands while Moses sat down the whole time. Even right now, I can kind of feel like this feels better. You know? You got, a, you got the entire nation and their existence thriving on you being able to hold your arms up. Moses is uplifting himself, you know? It's a, it's a sign of obeisance. So they help, and, and we win. They do let into sunset. That's when the battle is over. And we win. This all takes place at Raphadim. So when you read over these words, it's often that we just scroll over them not knowing the significance of what took place. All this took place before we got to Mount Sinai. 
This is just one spot known as Rafadin. But I like to, when they when they throw out these places, because they mention them, I'm thinking, well, maybe the Most High wants me to know something about it. Let me go and do some digger deeping. So I did, and that's what I found. The Amalekites were real people. When the scholars went to go and do some more investigation around that area, they found a proto hebraic Syriatic script that said Amalekites died over there. And of course, they can't explain it because it's anachronistic, meaning that it goes against their timeline. But if it's perfectly with scripture, we knew, we know that we were over there. And I believe this book. I believe we're still trying to find out things that are in this book, but that we're, it's not incorrect that we are. Our timeline is wrong, not it. You know? So that's what happened at Rephidim. And it says, we came to the wilderness of Sinai, finally made it to the mountain, and camped in the wilderness. It says, so Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to Elohim, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and to declare to the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Mishrites, the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you out to myself. And now you, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples. For all the earth is mine. Stop there. We give so much credence about, oh man, these Gentiles, these pagans, these unholy nations. He's telling you, listen, all of it is mine. Where did the devil have any part of creating other than helping to spread sin? And murder. When you read in Genesis the seven days of creation, when was Lucifer ever mentioned in having any part in that? That includes all of mankind. There are doctrines out there that talk about these people are devils and da 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 da. They can be devils in the spirit, of course. And as a result, have be the be the children of the devil, of course. Yahshua deemed some people to be the father, uh, I'm sorry, the uh the children of the devil who were of his own kind. But what y'all emphatically stating is that it's all mine. I made all of this. This is my covenant, just like these things, these are my feasts. They're not Jewish feasts. They'll tell you that, and that's a lie. They're not Hebrew feasts. Alright? They're not Levitical feasts. They're not Ars Kanazi or religious feasts. He said, these are my feasts. And that's the only title that you give. We keep the my feasts of the Lord. We can see that. Because they belong to him. They're not my feasts. You know what I'm saying? Because when we're to keep them, anyone's accepted. Native, foreigner, Gentile, freed, enslaved, rich, poor. So anyone's accepted. Because these are his feasts. This is the one time that Israel can't be selfish. We, we, we can't be tribalistic. We can't be racist if you believe that it exists back then. I don't. We cannot believe, uh, we cannot be um, segregates. That exists. We couldn't be any of these things. Because you'll read later on in Acts what took place on this day. And who all was involved there? These are his feasts. Right? And everyone who wants to join in is invited. If you are in the land, you don't have no option. It's, it's uh, um, a prerequisite. It's mandated. It's compulsory. If you are in Israel during these times of these feasts, you have to keep them or you got to get the hell out. Those were your only two options. That was it. That's how serious he is about these feasts. So anyway, let us go. He says there will be a treasured possession above all the peoples for all, all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. And Moshe came and called for the elders of the people that set before them all these words which Yahweh had commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we do. Some verses say we shall surely do, but you see the do part, and you see you see the we because it's a universal thing. But what they are in a sense saying is, I do. What, when when do we say that? 
in, in this culture. When you get married. When you get married. So let's rewind again. Now, so what was y'all doing when he brought us out of Egypt? Well, most people want to know a little bit about, um, a lot of bit about the person that they are inquired to marry. We didn't know y'all, but y'all knew us apparently. So bringing us out of Egypt, he showed, he peacocked, right? Let me show you, let me show you what he did. As a man, right? You ask a man, you want to marry a woman, what you gonna do? I'm gonna go talk to her father. Yeah, I like that answer. I like that answer, because politically, politically it's correct. But even before you talk to her father, when you're around, you want to peacock a little bit. She see you, I know you see me. You see these pecs, right? You see this bun, you see me. You want to peacock a little bit. If there's other men around who, whatever, you're going to try to show I'm the top dog. I'm a top contestant. This wasn't me. He could do that. But I got X, Y, and Z going on. Now, it may be subtle. It may be unsubtle. But it's peacocking nonetheless. Y'all had to deal with over 100 different gods to get these, his prized possession out of there. So he peacocked and rendered judgment on all of them. And you're like, man, I thought those guys were sick. I thought they was the real deal, but man. You know? It's like if, 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 if a man wanted a woman and another dude was interested in her, he can't, he, and, and the dude she's with got a nice little car, but you pull up in the American muscle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then y'all y'all take off and you just burn them. You're like, oh man, I thought, I thought he had the best car on the block. It's superficial the way I put it, but that's what he was doing. He was peacocking. And, and he wooed us. He won us over. Did what we thought was the impossible. You ever met a man and he did what you thought was impossible? Like, oh my gosh. He exists. He's like, whatever you want, here, take it. <laughs> take it, you know? Okay, so that's what happened. And, and he says, so you seen what I did? He didn't even mention the Amalekites. We just talked about, we know that it happened before we got to the mountain. But he mentioned the top dog of the world at that time that y'all took on single-handedly. And he said, well, you seen what I did to them? That's what he's saying. It's like it's nothing fun. You seen what I did to them people over there, huh? Now, if you keep my commandments, this is what I'll continue. This is what I'll further do for you. I, he really already had done enough at that point. True. But he's saying, look, if you do this and keep my guard, my commandments, I shall make you a prized possession above all the earth. For it's mine anyway, so I have the power to do so. Easy. It's a no-brainer. Who's doing that? The Egyptian gods didn't do that. The Egyptians gods, they didn't even do it for the Egyptians. Fact. Who was offering that type? So much requiring so little. Nobody. Unheard of. Unheard of. And this was a revolutionary thing. Moses was the first revolutionary. By far. Because he challenged a, um, a, a polytheistic system. Number one. With a. Uh, uh, what you call a, a mono DC system. Of one worship. One, one deity. Who's people becoming one? There was no segregation in that regard. He was revolutionary. Then he went and rebelled against the powers that be and then had them taken out <laughs> and then started a new nation. That's revolutionary. Wow. And we're reading about him there, so let me continue. Um, people said that all that the mouth of Yahweh has spoken, we shall surely do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moses, See, I am coming to you in a thick cloud so that the people hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. The reason why he had to do this is because the people, they keep questioning Moses' authority. They keep questioning them. We see that. The water. They say they're thirsty. They keep questioning them. So he said, I'm going to do one thing. And after I do this, Israel will never question you again. It's irritating. Moses has a job, but he can't do that because every time he makes a step that the people don't like, they start to question his legitimacy. 
then they gotta spend time reestablishing his legitimacy. And it's very, very counterproductive. Very, very counterproductive. So the most says, I'm gonna do one thing. And after that, uh, you gonna be a made man how they sit in the mafia, right? They can't touch it no more. He says, uh, and Moshe reported the words to the people, um, other people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, go to the people and set them apart today and tomorrow. And they shall wash their garments and shall be prepared by the third day. For on the third day shall come down, uh, Yahweh shall come down upon Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. This is the thing that he's going to do. And Moses is up there. I've, I've, I've shown you guys pictures of Mount Sinai. How the top is burnt. This was the cataclysmic event that did that. And it wasn't just some regular old pacifier. It was a raging fire that came out of heaven from nowhere. And it shook the earth. And it blazed. And it was bright. And the people were afraid. And there's a voice calling Moshe to come up there. And he's like, oh no, Moses is going to die. No. Because we thought he should surely die. We know Moses didn't die. So he was somehow able to walk into a burning, a burning mountain, trembling, <laughs> shaking, blinding, hot, and didn't die. That was the act that Yah said that I'm going to do. It's going to make these people never question you again. Right? Um... And he said, you shall make a border for the people all around you, saying, take heed to yourselves, that you do not go up to the mountain nor touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be certainly put to death. Not a hand is to touch it, but he shall certainly be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet, when the trumpet sound, the shofar, sounds long, let them come near the mountain. And Moshe came down from the mountain to the people and set the people apart and they washed their garments and he said to the people be prepared by the third day do not come near a woman or to know a woman so there was no sex relations going on during this period and it came to be on the third day in the morning that they were there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of a ram's horn which is the shofar was very loud and all of the people who were in the camp trembled and when Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain, and Mount Sinai was in smoke, all of it, because Yahweh had descended upon it in fire. And the smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and all the mountain trembled exceedingly. And when the blast of the ram's horn sounded long, and became louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and Elohim answered him by voice. And Yahweh came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. This is the event that Israel was watching, struck in fear, white with fear. Wow, it's happening. Terrified all thee, and there's only one man that's coming up, and it's loud. The ram's horn is loud, and then when sound hits anything nearby mountains, it bounces back, and it it's known as a resonant wave. We try to attenuate these in the studio because they build up. Like when you blow on a bottle, that frequency enters the chamber and has a hard time leaving. So you can feel the bottle vibrate. It's known as a Hemholtz resonator. It's vibrating. And if you hit the bottle with a certain frequency to make it resonate fast enough, it'll shake it. And if you shake it long enough, pow, the glass will break. That's how opera, opera singers are able to do so and break glass in the operatic voice. They are in a basin where there are, there are nearby mountains around. So when the sound travels out, it doesn't go out into infinity. It, sound travels at 1,130 feet per second. So that's a nice little distance there. It travels out, hits the nearby mountainous walls, which then reflected right on back to where they are. So you had a rock concert. But it's a deafening rock concert. And you see the mountain descend, this fire and smoke and lightning. It's like, what what's taking place right now? Nobody's had any LSD. No one's had any shrooms. No one's had even any mandrakes. No one's even been had, having sex. So what's going on? Everyone's in their right mind right now. What's going on? This is what 
gives Moses his validity. Right? Um, anyway, it says, And Yahweh came down upon the Mount Sinai, and on top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And Yahweh said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break, break through to see, to Yahweh to see, and many of them fall. So he's like, yeah, go down and tell them to chill out. This was the event on Mount Sinai. For me, I want us to go to Numbers chapter 28. And I'm going to start us in, um, I'm going to start us in verse 25 to 31. Actually, I'm going to start this in verse 26 to 31. My apology. And on the day of the first fruit stop. If I had not I told you that Shavuot has another name known as first fruits, you would have thought that this was another feast. It's the same feast. On the day of first fruits, when you bring a new grain offering to Yahweh at your festival of weeks, it's the same thing. Shavuot means what? The festival of weeks. Yes. On, on, at your festival of weeks, you have a Kodesh Mikra, a holy gathering. You do no serve our work. And you shall bring their burnt offering as sweet as a free, sweet fragrance to Yahweh. Two young boys, one ram, and seven lambs, a year old, with the grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an offer. Of for each bull, two tenths of one for the ram, one tenth for each of the seven lambs, one male goat to make atonement for you, which we one of the uh -huh, scapegoat, which is a different one, but you see that the, the, the goat was always the atonement. You know, uh, perfect ones they are for you, prepare them with their drink offerings, beside the continual burnt offerings with this grain offering. But again, without me having given you some background on Shavuot, you would have read this verse and be like, okay, I don't know what Shavuot means. Again, in the Old Testament, this was the day, theorized, and I, I highly believe so, that we received the Ten Commandments. This is the day that the Most High revealed himself to us that he hadn't done so to any other generation at any other time at that said time. And this is the time that we said we took him on. We said we do. Of course, we know that the moment we see that, we didn't do because we made the um, golden calf. And 3,000 of Hebrews had to die that day because he had said, do not do. And we did the opposite. What a bribe to give to him. And for all those people who are in such a rush to identify with Israel, whether it's the biblical Israel, whether it's the Israel over there in that land calling themselves Israel, I'm saying that ain't good enough. It's not good enough. How could you read this book and feel like that's good enough? Look how whomever was calling themselves Israel, look how they treated him look how they treated the ones that he placed in position look how they treated the days that he say to do look how how i'm not in a rush to be associated with that i want to be a perfect lamb to him as as, as blemish free as i can be that's my thing he will lift me up in those days he will he will let me know which gate to enter in through in the coming kingdom Whichever tribe it is that's spoken of in Revelations. In Revelations, you do know that when the new Jerusalem comes down, there can be 12 gates, each assigned to a tribe. And if you are granted access to it, that's when you know what tribe you belong to. It's not going to be some stupid chart where you're just assigning arbitrarily tribes to indigenous people all over by your women whammy. He's going to be the one to do that. Even this nation known as Israel today. He didn't do that. The United Nations did through a document known as the Balfour Declaration. And trickery. When he brings you out of something and into something, the whole entire world knows about it. It's not done under the cover of darkness. 
When he brought us out of Egypt, they all knew. They knew we were leaving. When he brought us into the land of Canaan, they knew we were coming. Go read about Joshua and the battles of Jericho. They knew we were coming. And so they built up walled cities and prepared themselves and the whole nine. Albeit it took us 40 years to get there, but that's because of us though. What I'm telling you is that I'm not in a rush to identify with anything right now other than Mashiach. But this is the only way you're going to get access to this coming kingdom anyway. The Father then is going to tell you where you're to go. What tribe you do come from, because though while we may not know, he knows. Which is Issachar, which is Levi. The only tribe that's not listed in this, in this list is what? Who knows? Dan. Dan is the only tribe that's not listed in, in, in Revelations when you start talking about they be gathering other tribes. And that's a whole other lesson as to why they're not listed. But they're not listed. But he knows though. The Father knows. He knows your DNA. He knows more importantly your spirit. I want to go um, from here to Acts chapter 2. We're going to start in uh, verse 1. One thing about these feasts, all of the feasts, if you haven't gotten the, um, the pattern or the algorithm right now, is that they are a foreshadow of things to come. So physically, we kept them in the Old Testament, not knowing what they meant, but it didn't matter because obedience isn't, you know, it's not really predicated on you understanding what it is you're obeying. You just got to obey. So that's what we were challenged to do back then. And I say challenge because you can go read about our challenges to obey his word. It's not until the Brit Hadashah of the New Testament that we start to see these things come out. And, and the Mashiach says, Blessed are you, because you are now able to find out what these things mean. Back then, they did it day in, day out, day in, day out. Thousands of years, and we never knew. It just became fossilized tradition at that point. We stopped even wondering what it even meant. But we're told to wonder on these things. We're told to think on these things. You should always be looking for the meaning that he's placed down here. It's going to give your life meaning when you find out. We know that we stopped doing that too. It became as custom as uh, Christmas and, and, and Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is supposed to have a bigger meaning, the pilgrims, yada, yada, yada. But you don't want to talk about that. For those who believe that Christmas is the Mashiach's birthday, they don't talk about that. They just keep Christmas, you know? Chapter 2 in Acts, this is what makes all this make sense. And when the day of the festival of weeks, I've already told you what that is, had come, they were all with one mind in one place. Says a lot. It says a lot. And suddenly there came a sound from the heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Stop. I just read to you an account of the sound that came from heaven, and the ram was blowing from heaven that he sent it upon a mountain on this day. In verse 3, And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and settled on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with each, other, with, with each other's tongues, as the Ruach gave them to speak. Now stop. A lot of a lot of Baptists and Pentecostal denominations, they call this speaking in tongues. And if you ever seen the phenomenon go on, it's something like this in church. They pray, they pray, they yell, they fall out, they start to shaking, and they get up and they start singing Hama Lama 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 Lama. No one knows what they're saying, but everyone's in this religious fervor. If you're giving out prophecy and it's from the Lord, there's always going to be someone there who's able to interpret that prophecy. Case in point. In Babylon, right, when the Persians came to take over, and that hand appeared and wrote on a wall. No one knew what he was saying. You can say he was speaking in tongues, but there was one man who did. What's the point of having a revelation or prophecy if the people don't know the prophecy? If there's no one to do interpret it. Y'all wants to convey a message. It is like, yo, Daniel knows how to read because it was Paleo Hebrew. Daniel read it and explained to them what it meant, gave them the prophecy. And then it happened. So for all these preachers who are speaking this Hamalama Lama Shama Lama Wabaluma Ben Matong, and you can't understand what they're talking about, what's the point? What's the point? His point is to get you his message, the Basara, the good news. And he's not limited to one language, including Hebrew. If you don't understand Hebrew, who do it in Chinese? 
You don't understand Chinese, he'll do it in, in whatever. Again, he told you, this is mine. It's mine. All mine. I'll do whatever I want. If I wanted you raise up a kosher prophet or take a stinking donkey to convey my message and he's done both, I will do so. I can do so. Who's going to challenge me? So that's just a quick note. If you ever happen to be in one of those churches and they do the Shama Lama woman, just ask them, what is that? What, what are you saying? Ask them. Even record them. Ask them to break it down word by word. What are you, what are you just told me, huh? How does that add up in scripture? Because if they come speaking not against this word, there's no light in them. So tell me what prophet you're speaking or quoting from. Anyhow, when these men start speaking in tongues, what they were doing was, you're going to read later, you had a slew of different nations there, not just Jews. You had the Parthians who are the Persians. You had Romans. You had Greeks. You had Cretans. You had Egyptians. You had a slew of different nations and they all spoke different languages. The one thing that unified them, the one thing that gave them the, the one mind we read about earlier is their fervor to want to worship Yah. And then worship Yah on the days that he prescribed and this day was that day. Shavuot. This day you couldn't say don't eat with the Gentiles like they were accusing the Mashiach. You had to because these were his feasts. You, you didn't have it to say, I don't want to eat with them. He says, gather. Then you better do it. And we were gathered. All gathered in one place. And that's not even the beauty of it. The beauty of it is that we had one mind. You had people from different cultures, backgrounds, ethnics, upraisings. None of that matters anymore. What one mind did they have? I gave a lesson on the mind of Mashiach. What mind do you think they had? One acts. Yahshua has already died and resurrected. He's not there. So what one mind do you think they possessed at the time? The mind of the Mashiach, which if you do obtain the mind of the Mashiach, you automatically are that much closer to possessing the mind of the Father. There I say you may have it. Because it was the Father, not Mashiach, because these are my feasts. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and settled on each one of them. Wait, I'm going to skip down to verse 5. Now in Jerusalem, there were dwelling Jews, dedicated men from every nation under the heaven. Hmm. And when this sound came to be, the crowd came together, just like in the Old Testament. When we heard the, the uh, trumpet, we were to assemble. The crowd came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in its own language. This is what they're telling you. You had Parthians and Greeks. Like Timothy was a Greek, but he was a Jew. But he sp spoke Greek. These people spoke their own language. But, and I know I don't speak Russian. But you're speaking Russian and I can understand you. It doesn't make sense. And I'm speaking back to you in my native tongue, which is Hebrew. And I know you don't speak a little Hebrew. And you, you, this does not make sense. How are we having two dialogues with two different languages and we're able to understand? It didn't make sense. I understand that you are speaking Russian. I can identify Russian when I hear it. Does not mean I'm able to interpret it. But I know Russian when I hear it. A lot of you know Spanish when you hear it. Doesn't mean you know what they're saying. All of a sudden, somebody starts speaking in Spanish, and you're like, oh, I know what you're saying. Then he say, oh, me, I really know English, but I know what you're saying. But he says it in Spanish. The astoundment that went on, there, this is what's happening on Shavuot this day. Back then on Mount Sinai, he gave us the Ten Commandments. But what's keeping the commandments if you don't have any spirit, if you don't have the Holy Spirit? Years later, he poured out his spirit and gave us the Ruach HaKodesh, came down. We were all assembled in one room, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. And this was one of the first things that we can do with the spirit. <laughs> we was able to interpret it different languages. Dig that. Let's us know that this Holy Spirit comes from the Father. And when he gave it to us, we was able to interpret different languages. So for those who specify so much on or the Gentiles in this language, it lets you know that he's not limited. He can understand anything. If you pray to him in an African dialect, if you pray to him, whatever language you speak, he's going to be able to receive it. That's the takeaway. It's a nice little dandy treat, of course. But it lets you know that the Father's not limited to our skin color, our creed, our sex. If it's from the Spirit, it should be received by the Spirit. And when he dropped down just an ounce of it, we was able to do it, and it, we didn't know what to make of it. He's not limited. We box him in. It says everyone was able to speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to each other, Look, 
Are not all these who speak Galileans? They're not all Galileans. And how do we hear each one in our own language in which we are born? Parthians, which are Persians, Medes, which made up the Persian Empire, Elamites, which is down there in the south in the desert by Negev, and those dwelling in the Aram and Naharim, both Yahuda and, and in Cappadocia, or Cappadocia, which was more like the Greeks, Pontos in Asia, which is more like the Turkey, both Persia and Palua, which is also in, in Turkey. They had a lot of different nations over there. Egyptians in part of Libya and Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own language. The great deeds of Elohim, and I'm glad they gave it to him because that's what it came from. And they were all amazed and were all puzzled, saying to each other, what does this mean? But I just kind of told you what this And others, mocking, said they have been filled with sweet wine. See, those who didn't know, they thought we were drunk. But Peter stood up, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to the men of Yahuda. And all those dwelling in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen closely to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you imagine, since it is only the third hour of the day. I'm not drunk. He rained on his spirit. And this is prophesied in the book of Job, or Joel, rather. And I believe Yahshua quoted it as well. It's actually in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 22. I'm sorry, verses 28 to 32, if you do want to go read it. So I got it written down in my little notes. Prophecy came to fruition. Men shall prophesy in their own tongue on this day. Now, that hadn't happened when we got the Ten Commandments on Shabbat back then. How blessed was the generation to see the fulfillment come into play. You know, the whole, the whole nation of Israel could have caught that play had they not rejected Mashiach. But only a few caught it. Only a few caught it. So on the Feast of Weeks, that's what we did in the Old Testament. New Testament, he gave us the Holy Spirit. Old Testament, on Shavuot, he gave us the Ten Commandments. Well, we know in Jeremiah and in, in Isaiah and even in the book of Hebrews that the law is to be written in the inward parts. You are to have a circumcision of heart. Now, you can't literally get your heart clipped. So it's a spiritual thing now. It's a spiritual thing. That's what that means. You're seeing the spirit be poured upon these people. Not just commandments written in stone, but the spirit poured upon them. And when they have the spirit, they're able to do things that they would normally be able to do in the flesh. To the flesh, it'll never make sense. It's two different languages. They're not supposed to agree. They're not supposed to agree. We gotta stop trying to make them. They don't agree. Leave it at that. What a blessed day that this day is. It's a and just think, on this day, trumpets was blowing, we got to take advantage, you know, then thousands of years later, we, we got, we assemble on the same day, and then we get the Holy Spirit, and then we're able to communicate. We're all there. We already have one mind. That's what I'm telling you. I don't have to marry a woman who has my customs. If she has my mind, then we're perfect. She don't have to even speak the same language. How, how do you think they was able to coordinate the meet upstairs and no one spoke the other language? They, they, had, they all wanted to do the same thing. So much so that they was willing to go uh, past the language barrier, which stops a lot of people from doing a lot of things. They was like, nah, I want it. So they all had one mind. And because so, then he gave them one spirit and poured it down on them. And they was able to bypass the flesh and speak in the spirit, already possessing the one mind. Dope. That's our father, man. We don't know him because we don't know Yahshua. And we don't know Yahshua because we don't know him. Paul brings us home in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to start in verse 16. It says, for, all, for if the dead are not raised, then neither Mashiach has been raised. And if Mashiach has not been raised, your belief is to no purpose and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Mashiach have perished. If in this life only we have expectation in Mashiach, we are, we are all uh, the men of the most wretched. But now Mashiach has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. For since death is through a man, resurrection of the dead is also through a man. For as all die in Adam, so also all have been made alive in Mashiach. It says, each in his own order, Mashiach, the first fruits, than those who are of Mashiach at his coming. Then in the end, when he delivers up the reign of Yahuwah the Father, when he has brought you to nothing, 
all the rule brought to nothing, all the rule and the authority and the powers. For he has to reign until he has put all the enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be brought to nothing is death. Here's what's happening. I'm going to break this whole thing down. When Yahshua resurrected and Mary had seen him, he told Mary that she couldn't do what? She wanted to give him a hug and he says, don't touch me. For I have not ascended to my father. Now people say, well, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe she was unholy or maybe she was sin-filled. But then he turns around and, and tells, who was it? what apostle was that who says, I will not believe until I put my fingers through. It was Timothy? It was Thomas. It was Thomas, yeah. So when they see him burst through the door, everyone's afraid. They think he's a ghost. They think he's a ghost. They're shivering. Everyone's struck with fear. They seen this man get beat to death and then die on that stick and then get buried. They seen that. How are you alive? And you're looking at him clear as day. He wasn't an admiration. He wasn't uh, 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 transparent or translucent. You're looking at the flesh. How is he alive? Thomas is standing there like all the rest, shaking. And he says, he calls back his words. Behold. You think Thomas touched him? No. You think Mashiach knew Thomas would not have touched him? Yeah. One thing about this guy we call Yahshua, he's very witty, and he knows the spirit of man. Thomas talking all this smack. I ain't believe it till I touch it. I want to touch the holes. First of all, that's kind of blasphemous. That's kind of blasphemous. You want to touch his, 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 his mercy wounds, his passion wounds. You want to put your finger through it. They already put the nail through it. You want to in, in, inject. For... Why? But you know. All right, Thomas. So when he goes there and he gives them the opportunity to do so, no one ever touched them. They were too afraid to. Then the reverence set in. Now he was too holy for you to touch. And you realize what had just taken place. He knew that. But the reason why Miriam, he told him, I have not ascended, I have not been waived before my father. He's the first fruits. What happens with the first fruits? They had to be waived before the father first. No one can consume any of it first until it's been waived and presented before the father. This is why we did it back then. I had no idea. And this is the exact reason why I told Miriam, do not touch me yet. I'm a first fruit. I have not been way presented before my father. They were on earth for how long before he descended? 40, I mean, it was 40 days. And when he got up, other first fruits got up with him as well. This is what Paul is talking about. And they walked around presenting and waving themselves to the father for 40 days. Then he left. That's in scripture. Then he left. He got up. Those that died in Mashiach at that time got up as well. Walked around. People was like, yo, are we talking to, are we talking to these prophets? Because they talking like the prophets. And everyone was asking him. His room was floating around. It was, what a time to be alive, you know? They waved themselves. Everyone seen them. As many people in the day. The Roman authorities and the highest Jewish council was trying to stomp this out. Then they ascended. Mashiach is our first fruits. He is the first man. It wasn't Nimrod who died and resurrected. He's a false messiah and a bad one at that. It was Mashiach who was the first fruits, the first who had died and was born and resurrected. And then we're told of the order. We hope to see him at his coming. I want to see that. I want to see that. Yeah, I couldn't be around to, 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 to you know, because these people who died, believe in them like, like the prophets and everything, they got resurrected and was able to lay eyes on him and say, wow, that's him. And now they're being lifted up. Right? But I want to see him. I mean, if, if I die before he comes and I'm resurrected and I, that's cool too. That's super cool. But to be able to see this spectacle of him coming down, Man, I want to see that. 
I, I want to see that. So that is Shavuot um, in, a, in a sense. And I'm sure I can go deeper. But I don't want to make this too long. I do want to end uh, with prayer real quickly. Dear Heavenly Abba, we come before you today thanking you for another Shabbat. Another high, holy Sabbath Shabbat, O oh, Father. And ask that you just watch over us. And these days, in these last hours, when things are so detrimental, when things are so dark, that you keep a remnant for yourself. Whether we be that remnant or we are still struggling to become part of that remnant, I thank you anyway, because what you have given us thus far, this, these knowledge, these little grains, we hope to plant and make into a field, acres, yards even, Father. For you have revealed to us some of the things that our forefathers and ancestors never knew. Never knew. You've given us the heart, the spirit to inquire about you and our busy, mundane, fruitless lives. When we're so busy with so many things that will never hold up. We're so busy with so many things that will never stand the test of time. I thank you for giving us the spirit to still inquire about that is what is eternal. And more importantly, that which can become and has the potential to become eternal, Heavenly Abba. I ask that as we speak and as we teach and as we send these videos out to whomever listens and, and was able to just follow through until the, the end, that you, you give them the spirit to want to be hungry even more so, Father, that you lead them to you. For it's only you who can actually call them. We can fish them out and become pictures of men. But if you had never placed them there by the boat in proximity, then what can we do? That is up for you. You call them. When you call them, we fish them. When, may you make us more efficient fishers of men. Allow us to use the tools that you have endowed us with since birth, O oh Father, to perfect those, not for our glory, but for yours and your sanctification. To be a better shepherd, a better steward, a better stewardess of the tools and the gifts that you have given us because we cannot take it with us. Whether it be financial, opportunal, communal, whatever the case may be, Father, that you allow us to be true emissaries down here for you as prophesied in your word. That while these people make the devil's words come true, that we make yours come true in the same light, with the same vigor, and the same God, with the same spirit and tenacity. Oh, Father, we thank you in all things and all ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. That is the conclusion on Shabbat. Thank you all for watching. Have a good day.